Okay, hello friends and welcome to the Chabura. Tonight we are launching a new two-part public series titled From Christian Anti-Judaism to Racial Anti-Semitism. This series will explore the origins and development of anti-Semitic hate from its beginnings to the horrors of the 20th century. Leading us is Trudy Gold about our speaker. Trudy Gold was the former CEO of the London Jewish Cultural Center and one of the founder members of the British delegation to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. She has taught modern Jewish history in schools and universities and for adult groups throughout the world. She's the author of Time Charts, History of Jewish Civilization. And thank you so much all for being here and for all those who will be watching after. And Trudy, thank you so much for being here with us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And if we could just see the opener slide, thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. And tonight it's quite a tough subject. I was speaking to Rabbi Dweck today because what I think we will probably do is look at theological hatred in the next two sessions and then later on look at race hatred. Um, it was actually the late great Jonathan Sachs who said, first they came for, first they, first they hated us because of our religion, then our nation, and now, and then our race and now our nation. So religion, religion, race, na nation. So the question is, where does anti-Judaism come from? Where does Jew hatred come from? And before I can even get into that question, I suppose you, I have to ask you all, do we all prejudge? Because obviously Jew hatred is a, one amongst many other kinds of prejudice against different groups. Prejudice, after all, means prejudgment. And why do we prejudge? It's really, I think this takes us into the realm of psychology. And if you think about it, when a society is relatively even, when people feel that they're having a good slice of the cake, as Marx would have said, where they're economically, socially, and politically stable, in the main, prejudices keep at a low level. But I think you will all agree that every one of us prejudges when you meet someone for the first time, you look at them. It could be the color of their skin. It could be the way they dress. It could be whether they're wearing a yarmulke or not. It could be because they have a disability. We all make judgments. And the problem with, stereo with judgments is that we then tend to apply the same judgment of anyone else who belongs to that group. Now, ironically, the whole notion of the state scapegoat is a Jewish notion. If you think about it at Yom Kippur, all the sins of the people were pushed onto the black goat and he was sacrificed. So the first question I want to ask you is, do we all prejudge? Is Jew hatred just another kind of prejudice or is there something a little more sinister? Because if you think about it, if you were to go to China, and I've taught all over China, prejudice against the Jews does not really exist. It doesn't exist in Hindu India. It's very much a pro product of the world of monotheism, particularly the world of Christianity. So the question is, why? Now, I'm going to read from, you, from an extraordinary man called Joshua Trachtenberg. In 1943, he wrote a book called The Devil and the Jews. Remember, he's writing it in the middle of the war, because if you had any rational sense, you would think surely the Shoah, the Holocaust itself, should have stopped any kind of Jew hatred. One of the most ghastly accusations against the Jews is money and power. If the Holocaust, what, what was the Holocaust, but an extreme example of powerlessness. So how does it all go on? So Trachtenberg actually asked the question, why are the Jews so cordially hated? What mysterious force can a weak and defenseless people, a minority be invested with the awesome attributes of omnipotence? How is it that men believe of the Jew, which common sense would, would they believe of everyone else. I'm sure through the COVID, you've all been aware of conspiracy theories. And I think you would also, all also agree, and I really don't want to get into the politics of Israel. That is not the subject of to debate. But Israel is a democracy. Whether we agree with the government or not, the fact that there are two thirds more notions passed against Israel than any other nation, the fact that 
Israel is so much the accursed nation is really, really out of proportion. And the question you then have to ask yourself is, is it actually anti-Semitism or, or Jew hatred? And going on with Trachtenberg, all the statistics and arguments that have been advanced to refute anti-Semitic libels have not succeeded in demolishing one single one of them. The sort of the kind of libels that Hitler swallowed whole that all Jews are communists, all Jews are capitalists, all Jews are rich, all Jews are parasites, everything you don't want to be. And he goes on to say, historians, sociologists, economists, anthropologists, not to mention simple lovers of truth and justice can argue, but to those who believe these follies, go on believing and acting as though they were true. Jew hatred is not rational. So how can one believe that all Jews are at the same time communists and capitalists? And when everything possible has been said about psychological xenophobia that rejects difference and minority cultures, because this is another issue of when we are feeling ourselves to be threatened, we, we tend to gravitate to that which we know. And it's the minority in your society that usually is the one that is blamed. <laughs> about the astute propaganda techniques of demagogues, about the need for a scapegoat, for release of social tension, about the imperfections of the Jews themselves and their abnormal economic status, all these are are patent stimuli, but the ultimate source buried deep in the mass subconscious is still untouched. Those, their lies are provoked powder keg of emotional predisposition of the Jew, which has nothing to do with logic. I don't usually read such a long quotation, but I think it's so important. The Jew is the arch, arch enemy of Western civilization. He is alien, not to this or that land, but to all Western society alien in his habits, pursuits, interests, character, very blood. Wherever he lives, he's a stranger apart. He is the arch degenerate, infecting lit literature, art, music, politics, and economics with the subtle poison of his insidious influence, ripping out of the moral foundation stone by stone until it will collapse helpless into his hands. This is his final goal to, to conquer the world. Well, if you think about it, this is written by a very, very interesting Jewish academic in the war. He doesn't yet know the appalling result of the show when a third of all Jews were murdered because they were Jewish. But already, if you think about the 20th century, the rise of fascism and how the Jew was scapegoated from country to country to country. And the contention of most Jewish historians in the West, and I'm mainly talking about the Ashkenazi community here, is that it is actually in the Christian Gospels that you begin to see the real problem of Jew hatred. Now, let me say, let me say very, very carefully, Jew hatred um, existed prior to Christianity. Um, there are references in both the Greek and in the Roman sources. In Alexandria, for example, this is before the rise of Christianity, Jews made up 40% of the population, and there was an incredible antipathy between the Jews and the Greeks. But this is nothing compared with what happens with Christianity. And this is the problem we have, because Christianity is a religion of love, it is a religion of faith, and it's a religion of morality. But from the Jewish point of view, and those of you who have traveled, those of you who have traveled and you've looked at the great cathedrals of Europe, those of you who have, if you like, been aware of Jewish history will know that from century to century to century, from the advent of Christianity, the Jews were singled out as the scapegoat. And the problem leading on from Christian theology, Christianity was an incredibly successful religion the largest religion in the world. More people adhere to Christianity than any other religion. Ironically, Islam, the other monotheistic religion is also on the march. And the belief is by about 2004, about 2040, it will, it will actually have overtaken Christianity. But these are the two largest religions in the world with more adherents and yet, both of them try and trace many of their roots from Judaism. But Christianity, the problem with Christianity is the story of the Christian Messiah.
Now, let me say from the beginning, and I'm sure many of you will know this, that Mashiach in the Jewish tradition means an anointed one. But what happens with Christianity is they take on the idea of Mashiach. They make Jesus into the Mashiach, but he becomes a divine figure. And the people who are meant to be responsible for his death are the Jews. Consequently, the Jews perpetrate the greatest crime in history. They kill a god. They commit the crime of deicide. They are the people amongst whom Jesus is born, but he is successfully Judaized. So is his mother. If you give them back their Hebrew names, Miriam is Mary, Jesus is Yeshua. It's only the father in inverted commas, Joseph, who keeps his Jewish name. And if also think about it further, the Hebrew Bible, which they call the Old Testament, is merely the foretelling of the coming of Jesus. Now, how did it all happen? Now, to get into the origins of Christianity is very, very, very complicated. Because if you think about it, I would, as a historian, I would say, where are the sources? Where are the sources of Christianity? And the answer is, it's the Christian Bible. They're gospels, which means good news. They are propaganda documents. There are a few lines in Josephus, but the majority of Christian historians now think they are an addition. Why? Because Josephus refers to him as Christ, Christos, and he was a practicing Jew. No Jew would ever do that. So we have the Gospels. And the first Gospel was written about 40 years after Jesus' death. The last Gospel about 120 years after Jesus' death. Can I see the next slide, please? Now, this is from Matthew's Gospel. This is Matthew chapter 27. Now, the story is this is the death of Jesus. Now, there, the four major gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all have different accounts, but there is a continuous thread in all of them. And just to kind of give you a historic context, which we can cross-reference, we know that it's the Passover. We know that it's a time of great unrest in Jerusalem. We know that there are four major parties, the Sadducees, who were the kind of Jewish aristocrats, who wanted to adopt Roman ways. Remember, it's a Roman colony now. Then there were the Pharisees, the rabbinic party, who looked after the, who looked after the poor. They were the ones who tried to keep the people to the religious past. There were a group called the Essenes. Those of you who know about the Dead Sea Scrolls will know that they lived in caves in the Dead Sea. They were a very aesthetic group. And then of course, there were the Zealots the zealots who wanted to get rid of oppressive Roman rule. Because one of the problems with the Jews and the Romans, look, the Greeks and the Jews, if Greeks and Jews, Romans and Jews, the Greeks conquered the known world. Rome conquered Greece, but Greek ideas took over Rome. And when they conquered a people, they took on the gods of that people and they expected that God would be worshipped in their pantheon along with their gods. But they had a problem with the Jews because the Jews had this all powerful, unseen God who demanded justice, who demanded, who, who demanded the value of life. And so the Jews were in a very, they were very troublesome people. And we also know that the Roman governor of Judea was a man called Pontius Pilate. Now he we can cross-reference, and he was also one of the most appalling the evil procurators Rome had ever had. Now, in this story that comes from Matthew's Gospel, and remember what happens in the ensuing century, the Jews revolt against Rome. And of course, they are defeated and they move into exile. And Judea is renamed Palestrina for the Philistines, the greatest enemies of the Jews. So Judaism is downcast. The Jews have been destroyed, and of course they move into the exile, the second exile. Now, the problem is this. We know that Pontius Pilate was a really, really tough guy. Can you imagine that a Roman procurator would actually allow a prisoner to be released? Because according to this story, the crowd come to Pontius Pilate and they, they want a prisoner released. And the one they want is a thief called 
Ba'abbas, Barabbas. Well, you know what that means. Now, this is the this is the the verse in Matthew. And don't forget that Christianity is going to go on the march. And most of the converts to Christianity are going to be pagan. So let's read this. The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus ex executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Bearing in mind, of course, crucifixion is the Roman method of, of, of execution. It's ghastly, but it's capital punishment, Roman style. If in the revolt of Barabbas, of the, of the slaves, over 2,000 slaves were crucified upside down. So they are asking for capital punishment. Why, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Cruc crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but then instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, and this is, some historians call this the warrant for genocide. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and he handed him over to be crucified. Now, what happens is we know that in the early days, the followers of Jesus worshipped in the synagogues. It's Paul of Tarsus. Paul came, he, he changed his name from Saul to Paul. He was a tax collector. He had an epiphany on the road to Damascus, and he believed that Jesus was in fact a divine figure. And he begins a huge preaching in the world of the pagans. And Christianity is going to spread like wildfire because what Paul does by one act, he says, Jesus has come to this world to save you from your sins. And if you believe that he is the Godhead, then when you die, you will inherit the world to come. He has, if you like, fulfilled the Jewish law. There is no longer the need for the mitzvot. You no longer have to be observers of the commandments. Look, we know that in Roman times, there had been many converts to Judaism, something like a tenth of the empire, and many women, particularly very aristocratic women, because think about it, the philosophy of Greece and Rome, the, the art, the music, the theology was rather undeveloped. And But the problem about Judaism, particularly for men, it means circumcision, it means the keeping of all the commandments. Now along comes a new religion, which also says, we have superseded Judaism. The Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible now becomes the Old Testament. And as I said before, that is just, if you like, the heralding of Jesus. For example, the, there is, um, there's a question from Rob Sher. Uh, yes, Rob's asking, yeah. Um, Rob, let's keep the questions for the end because it's very, very complicated. The reason I read you Trachtenberg is I really didn't, I, the reason I wanted to do this is that, is that you get a glimpse into the irrationality of Jew hatred. But you've got to remember, this is about faith. This is about belief systems. And this, as I said, certainly people like Robert Wistrich, Chaim Maccabee, they, that is the phrase, his blood be upon us and upon our children. Can we see the next slide, please? This is from John 8. This is St. John's Gospel. It, that was written about 120 years after Jesus' death. For many, it is the most beautiful gospel. Now, remember, religious Christians, uh, this is what they read. And think medieval times when the majority of people were illiterate. This is, you know, basically, this was what they would be fed all the time. John 8, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for is no, there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native tongue because he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I, you, I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Now, let me read to you from Maurice Goodman. Um, he was the chief rabbi of Vienna in 1907. The Christian needs, kneels before the image of the Jew, wringing his hands before the image of a Jewess. His apostles, festivals and psalms are Jewish. 
Only a few are able to come to terms with this contradiction. Most free themselves by Jew hatred. Obliged to revere a Jew as God, they wreak vengeance on the rest of the Jews by treating them as devils. And this is Franklin Littell. He's a very interesting Christian theologian who became post... There was a movement after the Shoah. It was called post Shoah philosophy. And he was very involved in this. And this is what he had to say. The earliest Christians were Jews. And however harshly a Jew may criticize his own people, his stance is vastly different from that of the Gentile, criticizing the same proof texts and interpretations James, Paul and Peter would have perished in Auschwitz, a latter day fact. Gentile Christians dare not forget. That's quite a statement. He's saying James, Paul and Peter would have perished in Auschwitz. These are the Greek names given to the followers of Jesus. Important, I also mentioned, there were many, there were many messianic claimants in Jewish history. The historian Martin Gilbert puts it as many as 18. What they are, that at times of huge trouble, Jews come along to fulfill the prophecy of leading the people back to Jerusalem. And to some Jews, Jesus is mainly, mean, did he even claim messiahship? But if he did, he was a failed messiah because the whole purpose of messiahship, according to the Hebrew Bible, as I said, is to lead the Jews to a time of peace and hope and back eventually to their own country. So this is what he says. Peter, Paul and James would have perished at Auschwitz, a latter day fact Gentile Christians dare not forget. Occasionally, particularly in the modern period, de deracinated Jewish intellectuals, children of the Enlightenment, have adopted concepts and used language which originated amongst Gentiles, cultural anti-Semites. But the only real, but, but the only real amongst Jews is self-hate, a pathical condition amongst marginal Jews. And that's something I'm going to get onto when I talk about the rise of anti-Semitism, because one of the problems we're going to see that the Jews are going to have but a completely troubled history. Having said that, it's also a history of triumph. And I wanna say that from the beginning, the first time I meet you, I deal with a very, very dark subject, but please don't forget, we have managed somehow to survive. So can we go on to the next? Now this is important because this tradition of Jew hatred develops amongst the early church fathers. This is from St. Gregory of Nyssa. Slayers of the Lord, murderers of the prophets, adversaries of God, haters of God, men who show contempt for the law, foes of grace, enemies of their father's face, advocates of the devil, brood of vipers, slanderers, scoffers, men whose minds are in darkness, leaven of the Pharisees, assembly of demons, sinners, wicked men, stoners and haters of righteousness. Of what to accuse the Jews of their rapine, their cupidity, their deception of the poor, of thievery and huckstering. Indeed, a whole day would not suffice to tell it all. So the point I'm making is, and I've chosen a few extracts. I could give you hundreds. Look, between the death of Joshua of Nazareth, the, the if you like, the sacking of Jerusalem, Jews moving into the exile, the second revolt, the revolt, of course, Masada, Christianity goes on the march. And finally, the Emperor Constantine decides to make it the religion of Rome. Why did he do that? Did he need a unifying factor? In the early years, Christians were actually persecuted because particularly the slave population. But Constantine takes it on. His mother had become a Christian. Did he do it, as I said, because he believed, unlikely knowing Constantine, but he wanted a unifying factor. And that, of course, is where the whole notion, the Catholic Church, the only church, is set up in Rome. There is a passage in the Christian Bible where Joshua says to Peter, Petros, all the names, remember, have been all the Hebrew names are changed to Greek names. Thou art Petros, my rock, Petros is rock, and upon this rock will I build my church. So in Rome, you have the building of the church. And the church, Christianity, was one of the most successful religions, as I've already said, that the world has ever known. It goes on the march. 
in the end, Rome is going to fall in the West, but Christianity goes on the march. And in fact, the last country in Europe to be Christianized is Lithuania in 1367. Those of you who are interested in British history, it's interesting to find out when Britain was Christianized. And those of you who love traveling in Britain, I have a place in Cornwall. And if you go, the Christ Christians were brilliant at absorbing other cultures. And many of the early churches were built on pagan shrines. And many of the pagan customs, like for example, the mistletoe, the halo, were, ad were adapted from other religions. Paul, by the way, he had come from Tarsus. And we know Tarsus is the center of mystery cult religions. And also, if you like, the Janus face, the polarization of good and evil. Christianity has a far more developed sense of that than Judaism. And also Christianity concentrates on the afterlife. Now, the point is Christianity had believed that with the coming of Jesus, and I think somebody asked for logic, the world would, you know, that line, I mean, isn't it in Isaiah, and the lion will lie down with the lamb and the plows will be, the swords will be turned into plowshares. But the point is it didn't happen. So now there is the waiting of the second coming. But the point is Christianity spreads like wildfire, very much the power of the church in Rome. Now, the problem for the Jews is that as Christianity expands its power, it really also expands its power over secular rulers. I want you to understand that the belief system, what went on in people's hearts and minds, I cannot tell you, but the belief system, when your country became Christian, you would go to a church and the majority of the population after the fall of Rome, much of the population from country to country, from nation to nation or from tribe to tribe was illiterate. Quite often priests were illiterate. Think about the power of the church and the building of the huge cathedrals. I remember the first time I went to Chartres in France and I've tried to imagine when it was built, how it must have dominated the whole of the landscape, the power of the church. And the other point was that the church wanted power over secular princes and kings. And the way they did that was to create this elaborate hierarchy. When you die, you go to purgatory. In purgatory, your sins are weighed up. If you have lived a blameless life, you can become a saint. St. Gregory, St. John Chrysostom, these are saints. And the point of sainthood is that you will then spend the rest of your heavenly life with Jesus and the Almighty and the Holy Ghost. This was the belief system. But you could buy time off purgatory by giving money to the church, tithes. The church had their own courts. Those of you who live in North London, I mean, think of Templars, Knights Templars. They were one of the great church orders, think of Temple Fortune, think of Kilburn Priory. The church had huge lands from country to country to country. And everyone in society had to belong to a guild. The peasants, of course, were tied to the land. But if you were a blacksmith, it was a blacksmith's guild. If you were a carpenter, it was a carpenter's guild. And these guilds were Christian guilds. So you have the, the popes are trying to take power over the secular princes. But the secular princes, they have to survive in a secular world. Secular princes need to engender an economy. They need trade. Now, Jews are already, they've already lost their own country. There are already Jewish communities spread throughout the world. And another thing, the known world, and another thing about Jews, male Jews had to be literate. They're not allowed. Now, this is another important factor. They're not allowed to be part of regular employment. And gradually, they are going to become the merchants and money lenders. So often they are very useful to secular rulers, but loathed by the church. And we also know from many of the records that in, you know, in peacetime, we, for example, there were, per, there were Persian merchants between the 6th and the 12th century called the Radonites. They were Jewish merchants who went all the way to China. And what do you think they were bringing back? The silk for the court. Think about the furs of the interior of what today is Russia, Poland. Think of the spices of India. 
courts want these kind of things. So basically, Jews fulfill a very important function in the economy, but they are outside the economy. They are outside normal life. In the main, and this is a very complicated area, they were under the protection of the king because the king, if they, they were the debt collectors of the kingdoms as well. And if you owed money, if the barons owed money, the, the king would take a percentage. So basically it is a balance between the Jews and it's a balance between the secular and the religious rulers. So when there's an upswing of church power and the most appalling thing that happened to the Jews was really the development of the Crusades. The first crusade was in 1095. There are going to be eight of them. Now, what was the crusades about? Islam, which of course burst out of what is today Saudi Arabia, it was known as the Hejaz. Within a hundred years of the creation of Islam, Islam had actually taken much of the known world. I don't know how good you are at geography, but if you imagine sweeping out of the Hejaz, going through the Middle East, going all the way along the southern coast of the Mediterranean, through Egypt, down into what is now the Sudan, all the way through the countries, right up until crossing the Straits of Gibraltar into Spain, and are finally stopped at the Battle of Poitiers. So Islam, but the real rancor, was that Islam was now the guardian of Jerusalem, which is the holiest site in Christendom. So the Pope, the Pope of the time, what he wanted to do was to unify the kings and princes under his control. So what he does is he calls for crusade, crusade against the Muslims. And this is when there's a huge upswing in church power and it leads to terrible massacres of Jewish communities in the wake of the crusading marches in the Rhineland, in France, there's a terrible, terrible massacres from country to country. Because if you think about it, why go to the land, the Holy Land as they called it, to murder, to murder Muslims when on the way you've got the arch heretics, the Jews. So it's actually the crusading period that leads to this incredible upswing of, of um, of, of anti-Jewish power. Some of you are sending me messages. Can we wait to the end for that, please? Because it's a little bit distracting. Can we come to the next slide, please? This is from Pope Innocent III. Until today, in truth, the Jews are scandalized when they hear that God was scourged, was crucified, and that he died, holding it unworthy so much to hear that God enjoyed these things. The Jew who denies the Messiah comes and that he is God, let me, and he is God. Herod is the devil, the Jews demons, the one is king of the Jews, the one king of the demons. This is just to give you an, if you like, a representative sample. I could really, we could spend many, many sessions on this. What I'm trying to give you is a deeply anti-Jewish picture that the Jew is the scapegoat of, the, of Christianity. Can we go on please? And then we come to the terrible accusations. The Jew has now become demonized because who can kill God but a devil? And it is going to manifest itself in the most appalling ways. And this is a representation of the blood libel. Now the blood libel, interestingly, I want you to think about blood libel. It is the notion that people use the blood of babies for ritual purposes. And we know that it was probably part of pagan ritual. It was used ironically before Christianity was codified in 325 at the Council of Nicaea. There were many different heresies in inverted commas within Christianity. And they accused each other of using the blood of children. Now, anyone who knows anything about Ju Judaism will know that blood is taboo. But this accusation was actually first applied to the Jews in England, and it's going to spread like wildfire. Now, the first, um, the first blood libel against the Jews was, in fact, 
in Norwich. Now, what had happened was a, it was the first English civil war. Henry I had died, his son had died, leaving only a daughter. Can a woman reign in England? And civil war breaks out. Now, in order for a civil war to happen, and you've already got knights coming back from the Crusades already pumped up, you've got to remember the barons are fighting each other. They're fighting each other, so they need money. They need money for their armor. They need money to, to uniform their knights, etc., etc. So what happens is they're borrowing from the Jews and it's Easter time. Think Easter, think the death of gentle Jesus murdered by the Jews. The local priest, we know a lot about this blood libel, the local priest together with a baron whips the population up. They actually think that a Christian child has been taken by the Jews and used for sacrificial purposes. So what the crowd do is they burst into the Jewish quarter, they murder the Jews, but more interesting from the point of view of the Baron, is they burn the records of the debts. The debts, of course, are housed in wooden chests. So beginning in Norwich, and it, it funnels out in Britain, the most famous blood libel in English history is actually in Lincoln. And up until 1959, sweet St. Hugh of Lincoln, there was a plaque describing his death. It was only in 1959 that it was removed. And there's now a plaque saying that certain things do not redound to the, do, do not redound well to Christianity. So basically it spreads like wildfire. It spreads to France, it spreads to the German lands, and this becomes a a very dangerous motif against the Jews. And if I tell you that it still exists, the blood libel, there have been blood libels in the 20th century, in the 21st century. In fact, there was an Egyptian television program. It was kind of a big, it was a really big number and in it, the, the center of it is the blood libel. So it goes from country to country to country. When I begin to talk to you about racial anti-Semitism, that is about blood, because any Jew who converts can become part of Jesus's community. In fact, a Jewish soul is prized. However, by the time we get to the 19th century, there's a whole new idea of blood and race, and you can't convert out of blood. But, so, but what happens is this old blood libel nevertheless enters into society and it hits the Muslim world in Damascus from Christian sources. And tragically, particularly with the rise of Zionism in the Arab world and then in, in the rise of Zionism in the Jewish world and the establishment of Israel, the demonization of the Jew, unfortunately, this is one of the motifs and practically every country has had its blood libel. And can we go on, please? Let's. Um, here you see the burning of Jews. Jews are blamed for the Black Death was a terrible time in history, 1348 to 1354. Something like a third of the population of Europe died from the bubonic plague. It, we don't know. Was it the hygiene laws that not as many Jews died? But of course, they were blamed for poisoning the wells. So another upswing of Jewish, of, of Jewish persecution. They're also blamed for breaking into cathedrals and desecrating the host. There is actually a church in Paris where you can see the stained glass window of evil Jews going into a church and sticking swords in the host, which in, it's, it's the wafer in Christianity. In Catholicism, the wafer and the, and the wine become the blood and body of Christ. The Jews are, what happens to this, this um, story in Paris, because you read the, you have it interpreted, the stained glass window, but the, the wafer escaped and it floated to heaven and another church was built on that site. There was another appalling incident at St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna, where 200 Jews were accused of desecrating the host and they were all hanged. Also, competition from other merchants. There's usually an economic, um, there's usually an economic angle as well. So you see what's happening. You have the religious angle and the economic angle. Now, can we go on please? 
This is Simon of Trent. This is in, the, in Flanders. So what I'm saying to you is it spreads from country to country to country. Can we see the next one? There you see Simon of Trent again. That is, in, that is an engraving on a cathedral. Many cathedrals have images of Jews downcast. I hope I don't make you too paranoid because there is also great beauty in much of the art of the cathedrals. Can you go on, please? Now, Geoffrey Chaucer, why am I bringing up Geoffrey Chaucer? Because Geoffrey Chaucer, certainly when I studied A-level English literature, you did the Chaucer and Shakespeare paper. Geoffrey Chaucer, he's, he was writing um, in the reign of Edward III. By that time, the Jews had been expelled from England. Jews first came to England in 1066. They had been invited in by William the Conqueror to really be his money lenders. For the first three reigns under a strong king, they're fine. It begins to fall apart in the civil war. By 1290, they've lost their usefulness and they have been expelled. Chaucer is writing when there are no Jews in England. And his, the, the Chaucer's most famous work is the Canterbury Tales. It's the story of a group of pilgrims going to Canterbury Cathedral to pray at the tomb of Thomas a Becket. And on the way, they tell each other stories. One of, the one of the Canterbury Tales is the story of the blood libel. And it's the second nun's tale. So the point is, it enters literature. And if you also think about medieval passion plays, think about the kind of entertainment, the mummers, think about Easter pageants. The Jew is seen as the devil. It spreads into every branch of Christian culture. They're still useful to secular rulers. And what is also true of the Ashkenazi world, they do find a haven in Poland of all countries because Poland by the 1300s was a very big, it, it, it incorporates Lithuania, later annexes the Ukraine. It's a feudal society with a landowning aristocracy. Kings realized how important Jews could be to the economy, which also leads to the myth of Jews and money. The majority of Jews were never rich. In fact, particularly if you look at Eastern Europe, the majority of them were dirt poor. But what is the, the, the stereotype, despite the powerlessness of Jewish history and the powerlessness of the Shoah, the stereotype is what? The stereotype is money and power. And if you are the devil, of course, then you can be a communist and a capitalist at the same time. It means what is your aim to destroy that which is good? And even after Christianity goes in abeyance for a period in the Enlightenment, nevertheless, these kind of issues still continue. Anyway, so Chaucer's second, so Chaucer's second nun's tale is the story of the blood libel. The the murder of sweet Sir Hugh of Lincoln. And also those of you who love English literature, think Christopher Marlowe, who was a contemporary of Shakespeare's, the Jew of Malta, Barabbas. Barabbas is the devil. Ironically, he's probably based on an extraordinary Sephardi adventurer at the court of the Turks. Um, but more about that another time. And I suppose the most famous of all, Shakespeare, Merchant of Venice. Now, we could talk about Shakespeare and you could tell me that the merchant, actually there is the genius of Shakespeare is the layers of the onion. But when Burbage came on stage playing, playing Shylock, the audience would have booed. In fact, there is not a positive image of a Jew anywhere in European culture until, and I'm talking now about Ashkenaz, I'm talking about the West, I'm not talking about the world of Islam, until, 1743, when a figure of the German Enlightenment called Lessing writes a play called The Jews, and it fails on the Berlin stage because no one can imagine a Jew to be a hero. It takes the figure of Moses Mendelssohn, more about him another time, who becomes, if you like, the first Jew to enter the philosophy of Europe, that he writes Nathan the Wise. And it's interesting, this whole notion, this negative stereotype. In fact, I think I better stop there because I'm sure there'll be questions. And when I come back, I think on the 13th, 
I'll continue in this vein, and then I'm going to discuss with Rabbi Joy how we work on the translation from theological hatred to from to race hatred. Now, let me be very careful here. I'm giving you a terribly negative view of Jewish history. I'm looking at one of the darkest sides of Jewish history, but don't forget. It's also an extraordinary story of a people who triumphed against the odds, who do have a long, continuous history. I mean, Simon Dubna, one of the first of the great historians, what he said was that if you, if you think about it, the Jews take from civilization, they give to civilization, and they win their own way. They are the people of spirit, the people of destiny. So shall I stop there and have a look at some of the comments? And this is from Rob Scher. I'm not an expert on Christianity, but it does seem ironic that on one hand we're blamed for killing Jesus, but if he hadn't died, he would not have atoned for their sins. You know, Rob, there's a fascinating quote of Disraeli's. Disraeli, of course, the baptized Jew, who once said, I am the blank page between the Old and the New Testament. He always crossed the floor in the debates on Jewish emancipation. And he actually said, he, he crossed the floor against his own party. He said, how can you not emancipate the Jews when half the world worships a Jew and the other half them, his mother? Look, you're looking, of course, you're looking for logic. This is about faith. And this is from Claudia. Hello there. Are, there, are all that not a form of calm down the hopeless heart from miserable people, the power of manipulation through faith? Yes, and one of the problems we're facing today, particularly in Eastern Europe, is that of course the fall of communism. Communism, though the majority of Jews were never communists, much of the leadership were people of Jewish birth. And in fact, it was people of Jewish birth who broke down Jewish life in Russia. But it led to the notion that you, to say that Trotsky was a Jew is ridiculous because he threw it away. Marx, the grandson of rabbis on both sides, he threw it all away. In fact, he himself was a self-hating Jew. Having said that, that was the image. And of course, the fact that in the 19th and 20th century, Jews were very prominent as capitalists. What it's really about is that the people who were kept out of society in the West for 1800 years, when they're finally allowed in, Isaiah Berlin put it this way, he imagined a people, imagine you come from another planet and you land on planet Earth. And it's the most, it's the most extraordinary place that you've ever seen. And because back on your own planet, you have a tradition of learning. You quickly absorb the learning of the planet. You fall in love with its art, its music, its architecture. You take forward its business techniques. You want to be part of it. And then he goes on to say, how did the people on the planet view the Jews? If they were benign, they were exotic strangers. If not, they were enemy aliens. Are there any other questions? Uh, we have a question in the chat box all the way at the at the top okay from the, from nicole in the united states chinese people have some negative associations with jews and stereotypical jewish doctors perhaps their com competition they also disparage the way we play mahjong by, by the proper chinese way and also negativity about their final financial success do you think this is simply a product of christian influence um yes i actually do nicole that's a very very big question you've asked a very important question i think unfortunately they've taken on some of the stereotypes um when we started teaching in china um we found that a lot of the chinese the, a lot, the, the reason they wanted us to get involved over there was because of the nanjing massacre 300,000 Chinese were murdered by the Japanese in 1937. And what happened in Japan, in China, it was a shame society. So there were thousands of rapes, children were born. It was all hushed up in a way. And later on, there was insanity, there was suicide. And after the generation was dead, people realized they had to face the Nanjing massacre. And that's when they became aware of the Shoah. Look, I had a meeting, oh, I may as well say it, with the Chinese ambassador when we began the work. And he said, I like the Jews, they've never hurt China. They don't want the Jewish religion, they don't mind Jewish history. They don't, the, the thing they really hated was missionaries. 
because they said it's rude. And the ambassador said, you know, your civilization is almost as old as ours. You respect the family, you work hard, what's not to like? Now, obviously, the stereotype is creeping in from the West and also in Japan. In the war, the Japanese, although they ill-treated the Jews of Shanghai, they didn't deport them as the Nazis wanted. They had something called the Fuji plan. But the Fuji is a puffer fish, and if you eat it in the wrong way, it kills you. That's how the Japanese regarded the Jews. But one of the problems in China, there was a huge Jewish community in Kaifeng in the, in the, uh, in, in the year 1000. You know, in the year 1000, there were 40,000 people in London living in mainly wooden huts. In China, there were a million people. It was a trading cosmopolitan center. What happened to the Jews? Many of them assimilated. You could even make the case, and it chokes me almost to say it, that anti-Semitism is one of the keys to Jewish survival. It's a, I'm talking about the Ashkenazi world. And she goes, could it be they are sheltered from us in China, but they are our neighbors here in the West? Um, in China, um, let's, um, it's an interesting, it's a whole different subject, the Jews of China, and it's very, very interesting. Are there any other questions? Uh, what changes, like we're seeing this very blatant uh, Jew hatred, this Christian Jew hatred, and in, 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 at least in the West or in America now, um, it seems they're a lot more tolerant. Um, so what, what changes, or is it still lying there dormant? Um, well, don't, look, there's no doubt that the level of anti-Semitism in the West is as high as it's been since the war, yeah? I think everybody would agree with that. If it was all about Jewish power, how on earth, when you think of the powerlessness of the Jew, how on earth did that happen? Howard Jacobson had something very interesting to say. He said, they can't forgive us the Holocaust. And I think one of the other issues, there's very little concentration on the events 45 to 48. Israel has become the bete noir of the Jewish world. A lot of anti-Jewish, prejudice centers on Israel now. Now, I don't have to tell you from the Sephardi world what happened to the Jews of the Arab world between 45 and 48, and in fact, earlier than that. One just has to think of the pogrom in Baghdad in 1941. But that story is not told. Holocaust studies, I find it absolutely fascinating. We've just had Holocaust Memorial Week, yeah? And yet anti-Semitism is sky high. What I think has happened is there's a sort of, the Shoah is being de -Judaized. When survivors go into schools, they feel very sorry for these sweet, and I'm quoting now a friend of mine who is a survivor. They, she says to me, they feel very sorry for this sweet old lady. Do they really know I'm a Jew? Do they really know how important it was that Israel be created? And of course, so I think that's one of the other problems. I also think that Jews do tend to go into trades and professions which are what I would call prominent. I mean, if you think Hollywood, if you think department stores, Jews go into what I call visible professions. We're a tiny minority, and on the whole, we are a very successful group. Look, something like 24% of all Nobel Prize winners are Jews. I've got, re I know why, I think I know why that happens. You take a people and you always create a survival gene in them. All we have is, all we have is our little brain to survive on, but, what we're living through at the moment is economic, social, and political chaos. And what, the, what I think is one of the most disturbing facts is many other victim groups now see us as perpetrators. They see us as white, successful Europeans or Americans, where the reality, as you all know, is that Jews come in many colors and in many hues. But the point is, you're asking me to be rational and you cannot be rational when you're dealing with this. That's one of the problems. And I think, I think the, look, I don't think it's murderous. I think everything's changed because we have a Jewish state. And please don't forget how the Jewish world has changed so much since 1945. Look, before the war, nine million Jews lived in, 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 in Europe. Now, the majority live in Israel and in America. I mean, think of the great communities of the Sephardi world and what happened to them because of the persecutions. That story is not told, is it? In schools, kids study the Holocaust. I'll tell you what happened to my grandson. He's studying for his GCSE, Weimar Germany, in the, in the Holocaust. 
and his teacher gave a reasonable class. And at the end, she said, any questions? And two kids said, why are the Jews now perpetrating a Holocaust on the Palestinians? Even the use of that word is obscene. And that's where we're at. And one of the things, the reason I've asked Rabbi Dweck for more time, I want you to understand how anti-Semitism crept into the liberal left. It actually came through Russia. And ironically, much of the anti-Semitism in the Arab world comes from the West. So there's a lot to talk about. Um, I think we've got one more question, have we? Um, I live in Brooklyn and daily we're getting news about hating Jews. Why now is it so bad? Well, as I said before, I think it's because there's economic, social and political chaos. And we have been an incredibly successful minority, which means we are also a problem for other so-called victim groups. They do not see us as victims. And if you're not a victim in today's world, you're a perpetrator. And my last thought is on the statues. Um, there is a statue of Richard I outside Parliament. The worst pogrom in English history, the massacre of York and in London, was actually perpetrated in the reign of Richard I. That's just to, um, just a thought for you. Anyway, what I suggest is in, next time I see you, I'll continue on this theme and um, we will work out. Let me know if, if this is what you want or are there any other issues you want me to go into? That would be very helpful for me. I'm as look, speaking personally, look, I was one of the um, delegates to the, to the ITF, which is now IRA. We, re, we had the first conference of the new millennium was about the Holocaust. 60 heads of state or foreign ministers, we were going to teach the Shoah to try and combat prejudice throughout the world. And yet it's all turned. So what can I say? But I do not believe, as I said, there are many different factors. But on the other hand, there are more anti-Semitic attacks in Britain than against any other group by far. And there was a news item on, I think the BBC last week that any Jew who wears a yarmulke, any Jewish man who wears a yarmulke is under threat at London University. Have we got to the stage where one is gonna to have to make a university choice based on where it's safe to be a Jew? So should we stop there? Perfect. Okay, thank you so much. That was very insightful and we're very excited for uh, the next installment, which is gonna be on uh, Monday the 13th. And uh, thank you so much, everyone. For thank being you. Here. Nice and, uh, to meet day. you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Very you. interesting. Thank, thank you. you.